Tornadoes are one of the most complex weather phenomena to ever be observed on our planet. Most tornadoes do not cause significant damage, but at the higher end of the spectrum, they can leave towns and cities unrecognizable. Due to the extreme damage potential that tornadoes have, the task of warning the general public of tornadoes is up to the National Weather Service. And with the help of local government officials and storm chasers, the National Weather Service, or the NWS, is able to warn the public of what is coming. The warning system has five distinctive types that the National Weather Service uses to tell the public of what level of severity the threat is. At the lowest level, you have a radar-indicated tornado, which is a tornado that is indicated through the use of Doppler radar. All the way to a tornado emergency, a warning issued for when there is a strong amount of confidence that a violent tornado is on the ground heading for a populated area. Tornado emergencies are typically rare occurrences when they are issued, and many NWS offices in the country have never issued a tornado emergency since the official introduction of the warning type in 1999. Tornado emergencies are only issued with the utmost confidence. I mean, could you imagine what would happen if somehow there was a tornado emergency issued and there ended up being no tornado at all? April 15th, 2022. A tornado emergency was issued for portions of Arkansas that ended up having no tornado associated with the storm. How did this happen? Was the NWS incompetent and issued a tornado emergency because they felt like it? No. The situation itself that led to this tornado emergency being issued, while individually not that complex, led to a situation where the NWS felt like it was appropriate to issue a tornado emergency. While looking back, the decision could have been handled better, the NWS did what they felt like was necessary. And it was understandable as to why they did what they did. Even though the decision for a tornado emergency isn't exactly agreed upon. Today, I will look into the time that there was a tornado emergency for no tornado, and talk about how this even happened in the first place, and the resulting controversy after the fact. Welcome to Nature's Fury. The 2022 tornado season was, at this point, relatively unremarkable according to most, at least in comparison to what people were expecting the season to be like. A lot of people were overhyping the severity of the events that occurred this year, with Mother Nature coming in and reminding everyone why people need to keep their heads straight whenever it comes to this field of science. Not to say that the events weren't significant, in fact, quite the opposite. At this point, we had the following events. From March 5th through the 7th, a tornado outbreak occurred which included an EF4 tornado that went through Winterset, Iowa. From March 21st through the 23rd, a tornado outbreak that affected southern portions of the United States spawned 87 tornadoes. From March 29th through the 31st, a tornado outbreak spawned 90 tornadoes across the southern United States. And more recently at this point, an outbreak from April 4th through the 7th, which caused 86 tornadoes, including an EF4 tornado that occurred in southern Georgia. A lot of notable events, just for many people in the general public, nothing worthy of note happened because there were only two violent tornadoes. A problem that most of the general public has when it comes to looking at these seasons in retrospect. By mid-April, things were about to enter a quiet period of about a week or so in regards to severe weather. April 15th was one of those quieter days, or at least it was supposed to be a quieter day. There isn't really much to go over in regard to the synopsis, but let's go over what we have. But real quick, only a small portion of people who watch these documentaries are subscribed to the channel, so if you enjoy these documentaries, consider subscribing. It's free and it helps the channel a lot. Anyways, back to the event. A fast-moving trough over western Kansas was expected to move into northwest Oklahoma and southwest Missouri by the evening hours of the 15th. Ahead of the trough were strong southerly winds in the lower levels of the atmosphere, and strong moisture in the area, which helped to create instability for storms to form in Missouri, Arkansas, and Oklahoma. The expectation was that there would be supercellular thunderstorms capable of producing very large hail of at least 2 inches in diameter, strong straight-line winds, and the possibility of a tornado or two. After dark, the storms would continue to persist into western Tennessee and northwest Mississippi, with the system weakening afterwards. Then, the primary cold front would come in contact with the low-level moisture over east-central Oklahoma, creating the possibility of another round of storms. For most of the 15th, a line of relatively weak thunderstorms and rain showers was present across a large swath of southern Missouri, at 4.50pm Central Daylight Time, 
a severe thunderstorm watch was issued for northern Arkansas and eventually included portions of southern Missouri. At around this time, a broad line of severe thunderstorms began forming in southern Missouri, eventually extending into northern Arkansas. With the northern cell quickly dying off past 6.30 p.m., the southern cell became more dominant in the situation and quickly became discreet. At 6.50 p.m., a tornado warning was issued, and now we get into how this whole debacle went from a tornado warning all the way to a tornado emergency. I'll go over the issues as they occurred. Starting with the current issue, the storm was in a radar dead zone. In order to understand why this is an issue, we have to talk about Doppler radar itself. How Doppler radar works is that it sends a beam of energy, radio waves, out into the atmosphere. If the wave strikes objects in the atmosphere, typically precipitation of some kind, the energy is then returned back to the radar and provides the distance to that object. The information gathered from that beam of energy is then sent to the National Weather Service, who then puts it in formats to where we can understand it through radar applications that we use on an everyday basis. What I just described is a vast oversimplification of how Doppler radar works. However, the information I just said is enough to understand why radar dead zones are such a problem. Anyways, that beam is sent in a straight line, and if the Earth was flat, there would be no problems whatsoever. But the world isn't as flat as a pancake, and is in fact a sphere. Due to the fact that the radar beam sent out is a straight beam that goes in one direction, the further the beam goes out, the higher in the atmosphere the beam is sent due to the curvature of the Earth. Therefore, the further out the radar coverage is, the more unreliable it becomes, as everything begins to look messy and unconventional the further up in the atmosphere you get, and that information starts to become unreliable. So, hypothetically speaking, if a large area were located far enough from major radar sites, it would create a situation where detecting and accurately tracking the severity of a storm through the use of radar would be very difficult. Can you tell that I'm about as subtle as a pile of bricks? Those areas are called radar dead zones, and there are a lot of them. Mainly centered in areas where there is a low population, or was a low population when the NWS modernization happened in the 90s. Let's take for example the radar dead zone in southern Missouri and northern Arkansas, which is where this event took place. In the state of Arkansas, there are three major radar sites, and those sites do a good job at covering the central portions of the state. However, issues start to become apparent as you go further north and go into the northeastern part of the state of Arkansas. In that general location, there is a broad area that is far away from any major radar sites. Due to how far away the area is from the radar sites, it becomes difficult to really discern the specifics of how strong thunderstorms are due to how high in the atmosphere the beams are getting their data from. In the case of the area relevant to this tornado emergency, the coverage that the radar was getting its data from ranged from 6,000 to 10,000 feet above the ground. Basic knowledge of how storms work tells us that the radar data received from 10,000 feet in the atmosphere would not be the same if the radar data was received closer to ground level. As a result, the wind speeds are faster than they are on ground level, and the overall imagery that is detected on Doppler radar is messy and semi-inaccurate when going into specifics because the data was received from higher up in the atmosphere. Due to the problems that I just stated, in 2017, Congress asked the National Weather Service to research and file a report about the issue regarding how radar dead zones impact warnings. The National Weather Service stated in a report to Congress that there is not a significant negative impact to warning performance tied directly to radar coverage where the radar beam height is higher than 6,000 feet. Well, after this event, and numerous other events that have occurred lately in radar dead zones, I can say that the NWS and NOAA really need to reconsider their position on this. So, for this event, meteorologists had to rely on the Memphis, Tennessee radar station, the Little Rock, Arkansas radar station, and the Springfield, Missouri radar station. Due to how far out the storm was, finding out accurate information from radar was difficult. When the tornado warning was issued, meteorologists could tell that there was a velocity couplet. Basically, when the red and green meets, it means that there are rotating winds, and that there was very large hail. But any further analysis than that became problematic. On the topic of hail, the hail itself ended up being an issue as well. Okay, so we need to go back to radar analysis real quick. 
Let's talk about correlation coefficient. In meteorology, correlation coefficient, or CC for short, is a measurement of the consistency of shapes and substances in the atmosphere measured by a radar beam. Basically, CC makes sure that the objects in the atmosphere are consistent. Typically, most of the stuff in the atmosphere is water molecules due to radar snow, indicated by warm colors such as a dark pink and red. However, when there are areas of cooler colors such as yellow, green, and blue, that's a sign that there are objects in the atmosphere that are not typical precipitation. More often than not, a solid, well-defined area of these cooler colors, especially areas of blue, is evidence of a CC drop, or a correlation coefficient drop, and is often a signature of debris from the ground being lifted into the atmosphere. Usually, a CC drop is an indicator that there is a tornado on the ground. There was a CC drop of sorts with a cell that occurred on the 15th, but there was large hail present which made figuring out what the CC drop was difficult. Typically, hail isn't large enough to create an issue with CC, due to the fact that hail is often less than an inch in diameter, so the radar beam doesn't get reflected off the hail as much. However, when large enough, the large hail can start interfering with the CC, and if the hail core, where the majority of the hail falling is located, is located close to the tornadic circulation, difficulty arises from determining whether or not the CC drop is from the large hail or if it's from a possible tornado, especially when the two are really close to each other. When there are lower CC values across a large area, that is typically evidence of a scatter spike, which is what is observed when large hail starts interfering with the CC. Scatter spikes often give the radar a false echo in response to what is actually being observed. The hail size associated with this cell in question was 4 inches in diameter, and it quickly became obvious that issues would arise from the large hail. When the tornado emergency was first issued, there was an obvious scatter spike visible on radar from the storm. But the scatter spike made things difficult since it was lined up nearly perfectly with the velocity couplet, was it hail or was it a tornado? It was hard to say, but storm chasers could be about and report it, except there was another problem. When you see an image of a very well-known tornado, there is typically a very noticeable trend when it comes to when the photo of the tornado was actually taken. It's daytime. By their very nature, tornadoes are very dark in appearance, often being gray and it blends in with the clouds. Typically, you can see where they are because the light from the sun allows for us to see the tornado with our very own eyes. But when it's nighttime, that isn't the case. The only chance one could get of visually seeing the tornado at nighttime would be when the tornado itself is illuminated by lightning or a power flash while producing damage on the ground. However, neither of those are guaranteed. The initial tornado warning from this thunderstorm occurred when it was becoming dark and it made things even worse when it came to identifying the tornado, or even if there was one later on during the night. In order to confirm a tornado at night, the National Weather Service typically relies on radar imagery through the use of CC drops, but that's pretty inaccurate due to the combination of the large hail and how distant the storm was from any major radar sites. So at this point, the National Weather Service had to rely on damage reports left behind from the cell in order to have enough probable cause in order to issue a tornado emergency. The National Weather Service accepts real-time damage reports that influence how they issue warnings from suspected tornadoes from two sources, local government officials and National Weather Service certified storm spotters. Let's focus on the storm spotters as they are the part I need to talk about. How does one become an NWS certified storm spotter? You take a Zoom class and you take a test and if you pass the test you get a label. It is a very easy process that should honestly be harder in retrospect. What ultimately caused the tornado emergency was a storm spotter report that stated that there was a wedge tornado on the ground near Hardy, Arkansas. Two minutes later, the National Weather Service would issue a tornado emergency. The cell already had a particularly dangerous tornado warning attached to it, and there were already reports of roof damage, down power lines, and down trees. So, with the storm being in a radar dead zone, the large hail making things difficult to discern whether or not the CC drop is from a tornado or hail, the low visibility making it practically impossible to see the tornado at all, all it would take to issue the tornado emergency 
would be a report confirming that there was a large wedge tornado on the ground. So when that report came in, the National Weather Service was left in a situation where they felt like they had no choice but to issue a tornado emergency. So, with all of the issues laid out, let's go over what actually happened that night. At 7.18pm, the tornado warning was upgraded to a PDS tornado warning, a particularly dangerous situation. The reason for this being that Cherokee Village Emergency Management seemed to confirm a tornado at that time, with significant damage. At 7.35pm, the National Weather Service issued a tornado emergency due to a report from two minutes prior from a storm spotter reporting a wedged tornado on the ground near Hardy, alongside with reports of a roof being ripped off a home and tossed into a gas station. At 7.45pm, the tornado emergency was extended into Embolden, Black Rock, and Walnut Ridge, with a threat of a deadly tornado expected for the areas in the path. Between 8 and 8.15, the emergency was extended for Sedgwick, Fontaine, and Bono, eventually being extended into Jonesboro itself. At this time, a report came in of cars being flipped over Highway 67 in Walnut Ridge, with the National Weather Service repeating that a large, extremely dangerous, and potentially deadly tornado was on the ground. However, as the storm got closer and closer to Jonesboro and the storm finally got near more reliable radar coverage, it became more and more obvious that the storm was very disorganized and that the cell was at the very least on a weakening trend. With that in mind, after 8.30pm, the subsequent tornado warnings were labeled as radar indicated before being dropped altogether after passing into Tennessee. Many people were worried about what just happened, with many people thinking that a wedge tornado just tore through northern Arkansas on a slight risk day no less. So many people were upset when the National Weather Service toured the area the next day to find out that there was no tornado. So what actually happened? The storm itself did have a defined couplet associated with it during its whole lifetime, However, the storm itself was incapable of actually producing a bonafide tornado. There were multiple images of what seemed to be a wall cloud and a potential funnel trying to touch down as the storm was in northern Arkansas, but the mesocyclone itself associated with the storm was never able to touch down and become a tornado. At first, meteorologists believed that the storm spotter report was submitted in good faith, possibly mistaking a scud, a ragged cloud formation, for a tornado. However, the National Weather Service investigated the cause and found something different. Malicious, false reports that were traced to a lady in Cleveland, Ohio. Dennis Kavanaugh, a warden coordination meteorologist for the National Weather Service, said in an interview to THV11, a CBS news affiliate for North Arkansas, We are aware of one bad actor, one bad individual that was spoofing their latitude and longitude and sending false storm reports. The National Weather Service didn't find out until days later that the person was from Cleveland, Ohio, and later stating that it was frustrating since they rely on those reports to keep people safe. So what happened to that lady from Cleveland, Ohio who ended up sending a total of not one, not two, not three, but five false reports to the National Weather Service? Especially when Kavanaugh said that providing false information to organizations who issue warnings is illegal and goes against a federal statute, the truth is, there's nothing regarding any prosecution that was done towards that individual. There are some unclaimed reports that she was going through issues regarding the Storm Spotter Network, but that doesn't excuse sending false reports to the National Weather Service that can cause mass panic. From what I could assume, she got banned from the Spotter Network, and that's it. But we don't even know that, because we don't even know if she was certified or not, or just using someone else's account. What I can say is that she is going to get off scot-free after causing a massive panic in a populated area, even though she should be fined and prosecuted for what she did heavily. The remaining reports were not fraudulent, but rather due to the large hail and winds. The first reports from Cherokee Village Emergency Management were confirmed, but the damage seen was due to strong straight-line winds and large hail. The report from Highway 67 was found to be due to softball-sized hail accumulating rapidly on the highway, 
causing a large car accident. The meteorologists who work at the National Weather Service responded by saying that they would look into what happened and take actions to try and prevent situations like what happened on April 15th from happening again. Dennis Kavanaugh stated, We're not issuing tornado emergencies for instances where there are no tornadoes. That's not what we want to do. Those who were meteorologists were understanding of the situation, knowing how stressful the situation was, and how much consideration goes into making decisions in order to issue a tornado emergency, and that tornado emergencies are not issued because the National Weather Service just feels like it. The general consensus from the majority of the weather community at that time was that a tornado emergency shouldn't have been issued, and that it should have just remained a normal tornado warning throughout all of its lifetime, but they didn't attack the National Weather Service for their decision. The Jonesboro tornado emergency was one that was a result of numerous complex factors that came together to create a scenario where the National Weather Service was sort of forced to issue a tornado emergency. A result of poor radar coverage, large hail interfering with the correlation coefficient, the low visibility on the ground, and the spoofed storm report. Meteorologists can't just ignore reports because they are possibly fraudulent. The situation was way more complex than people give credit for. And the people who seem to be angry about this get their message heard further than the actual meteorologists doing their job, and the people who understand that the National Weather Service might have went a bit too far issuing a tornado emergency, but understood why they did what they did. Do I think that the National Weather Service was in the right completely? No. I believe they shouldn't have issued a tornado emergency looking back. Yet again, I don't have a degree in meteorology, yet. I'm not the one with years of experience in warning storms. I'm not the one who's on the ground chasing storms because gas is expensive and I don't feel confident in driving, at least that far out of state. And I'm not the one who is in the minority yelling and throwing a fit because a tornado emergency was issued and there wasn't a tornado in reality. Because not all tornado emergencies are perfect. This isn't the first time that this has happened, just the most recent. That doesn't mean the National Weather Service is immune to all criticism. Far from it. There needs to be further precautions in place to prevent situations like this from happening again. The investigation into how this all happened is still ongoing at the time of recording this, and I expect it to still be in progress after the video comes out. What the weather community should be doing is coming up with solutions so situations like what happened in Jonesboro on April 15th doesn't happen again, or at least it doesn't happen as often. And the weather community seriously needs to address the issue of radar holes in the country so that we can get a better idea of what a storm actually looks like. Something that the National Weather Service, specifically NOAA, said was not an issue when reporting to Congress a few years back, which turns out it is a serious problem. Maybe look into ways to prevent situations like from what happened in Jonesboro from happening again, as difficult as that may be. Anyways, I'm Alfaria, and let's talk about some stuff in regards to some channel stuff, this won't be long. I have plans to work on Hurricane Irene next, and hopefully work on the Super Tuesday outbreak thereafter. The interview with Ginger Z about Hurricane Sandy was successful, and there is a part of that interview that goes into Hurricane Irene, so she will be featured there in the Irene documentary for a brief moment. Besides that, I don't have any other interviews planned for Irene. If you enjoyed documentaries like this, please consider subscribing, liking the video, commenting, and sharing it around, as it helps the channel a lot. And that's all I have. I'm Alfaria, you all have a good night, stay safe out there, and I hope you take care.